My presentation is on positive externalities, a rare form of market failure. Positive externalities, at its core, is a failure of a market to produce enough of a good or service. What's unique about this failure is that there are a lot of big losers from producers, societies, and the economy as a whole. So, let's explore how an individual's consumption of a good or service can have a spillover effect benefiting others. Take, for example, access to rehabilitation services. If someone has a substance problem or gets into an accident, getting them back on their feet and economically productive is beneficial to that individual and society as a whole. But the example I want to explore in detail is vaccines. Not only are we living through it now in real time, but it demonstrates multiple layers of positive externalities. Let's look at our demand supply diagrams to show what we mean by an underproduction. If you got the flu vaccine on campus last week, you were of course protecting yourself, but you were also contributing to protecting the rest of the Loomis community, your family, and the local community. By reducing the chances of you getting sick, you also reduce the chance of spreading the flu to other people, providing a broader benefit beyond yourself. So, in the equilibrium point, EP, you are prepared to pay price PP and not more since you are a rational consumer and you are not going to pay for a benefit everyone else receives. Since there clearly is a benefit to society beyond the price you pay, there is a demand line to the right, let's call that the society demand. Connecting the dots, you can see that there is underproduction. Society as a whole is prepared to pay more to get more. So, why is the vaccine market such a good example of positive externalities? This market failure runs across a broad spectrum from vaccine development right through to administering the vaccine. Moreover, the more consumers demand a vaccine, the greater the benefit to society. Epidemiologists call this herd immunity, which can be achieved when at least 50% of the population has either had the disease or is immunized against getting it with the vaccine. Vaccines take a long time and a lot of money to develop and are complex and costly to produce. For example, the mumps vaccine was the fastest vaccine ever developed and it still took four years when it was discovered in 1960. Pharmaceutical companies are key players in this market failure. They are motivated to discover drugs that they can change the highest price for and maximize the return on their risky research costs, like a life-saving cancer drug, which could be more than $100,000, not a vaccine that no customer wants to pay for. Here's some evidence that supports that. A survey conducted by the Pew Research Center last month found that 21% of Americans that said they were willing to plan to take a COVID vaccine said that they were less likely to do it if they had to pay for it out of their own pocket. Campaigns to eradicate diseases also take a long time and are costly undertakings to administer. The program to eradicate measles started in the 1970s and yet the United States was not declared measles free until the year 2000. There are solutions to this market failure that have been very successful eradicating polio, measles, and mumps as examples all since the 1960s. These solutions have involved vaccine programs in which the government has stepped in to subsidize the research and development to create the vaccine. Now we see this paying out in real time with COVID with the US contributing billions of dollars to multiple companies all racing to develop a COVID vaccine. This has been referred to by the Trump administration as part of Operation Warp Speed. You can come up with a solution for COVID, but the government has to step in and take the bet. Which one will really work? There are 65 plus different trials for vaccines so far, but creating the vaccine is just the first step. Next is making sure the vaccine is consumed by consumers, remembering that most people don't want to pay much for it, let alone pay the full value society as a whole world would place on it. To solve this part of our market failure, government again steps in to mandate private insurers to cover flu vaccines, childhood vaccines, and now a COVID vaccine. In so doing, the government has socialized the cost of vaccines since the cost is ultimately reflected in what employers and employees pay in the form of higher health insurance premiums. So the cost is kind of hidden in that sense. The government also pays for vaccines directly through Medicaid, which is a government-funded program for the poor, and Medicare for over 65s. So have the solutions been worth their cost? Consider polio, which was one of the most feared diseases in the United States. Before the polio vaccine was introduced in the 1950s, 15,000 to 35,000 cases of paralysis was recorded annually, mostly in young children. This disease has a profound effect on the rest of their lives. This was devastating to those who caught the disease and a drastic decline in their economic potential over a course of a lifetime. This, of course, is a drag on society too. The measles was also a large drain on the healthcare system with 55,000 hospitalizations annually before the vaccine was introduced in the 1960s. The direct cost to individuals impacted by diseases that can be treated with vaccines is just the tip of the iceberg. The indirect costs are massive and widespread, including lost time at work for caregivers, lost time at school, and more recently, the COVID pandemic shutdown. In fact, Forbes, in an article in May 2020, 
estimated the cost of the COVID pandemic to the U.S. economy at a staggering $8 trillion. That's $25,000 for every person in the U.S. So who is impacted by this market failure? Without vaccine programs sponsored by the government, the entire population would be at small risk of several nasty contagious diseases. Others indirectly impacted are healthcare workers when large outbreaks occur and businesses with absent employees and customers quarantining at home. Others impacted by this market failure include the elderly, the poor, and those with underlying conditions that mean they cannot take a vaccine. There are also big benefactories of successful vaccination programs. Developing countries, including many in Africa, are profoundly impacted with international bodies such as the World Health Organization and the Gate Foundation stepping in to support vaccine programs in the place of government intervention in those countries. These programs have had a lot of success in eliminating diseases, but they are still not perfect. Despite handing out the flu shot for free, the take-up rate for adults is only about 45%. As for a COVID vaccine, among roughly half of Americans who say they would not get a COVID vaccine, 76% say concern about side effects is a major reason why they would definitely or probably not get it. Since it seems to be true that customers underconsume vaccines, this must mean, despite all these programs, there is still an underproduction. So the question is, how can we get more people to take vaccines once we introduce one that doctors and medical professionals confirm is safe? I've got three ideas on this. The first one is a tax on travel. Many people travel nowadays, pre-COVID obviously, and the mere fact that it is cheap to travel causes a risk of the spread of communicable diseases. So in that sense, maybe we can say that travel, particularly travel to other parts of the world, creates a negative externality, but that is a topic for someone else. Maybe in order to be able to do any international air travel, you must take a COVID vaccine. If you don't, you could be a spreader. You could cause economic damage by wandering around the world without a vaccine. Should there be a tax on international travel to reflect the cost to society? Maybe employers can play a bigger role. After all, they lose out when their people can't come to work. Employees can administer flu shot programs to their employees. If every business organized a day where everyone could get shots, much like what we do at Loomis, and get at least 80% of people to conform to it, risk could drop dramatically. Government could pay an incentive for every employer that achieved 80% coverage. Using technology, social media influencers could be another way of increasing vaccine compliance. For example, Cristiano Ronaldo has a quarter of a billion followers on Instagram. An endorsement from him or anyone else popular in social media could go a long way. But it comes without saying you can't obviously force someone to stick a needle into someone's body without their consent. Overall, vaccines represent a multifaceted example of positive externalities and vaccine programs have been very largely successful. However, declining compliance of flu vaccines and potentially the COVID vaccine presents a potential limitation to government intervention in this market, requiring new ideas and potentially technologies such as social media.